excuse me while I wake up my computer. Um, here we go. Guys, this city has changed a lot in 10 years, I can tell you that. Uh, the last time I was here, as was mentioned, was nine years ago, perhaps, and we were working on a little um, community design south of here in, in Gaston, where we were trying to figure out how to do a car-free, bike and pedestrian-only neighborhood. Um, it never came to fruition, unfortunately, but that's how I came to know a little bit about Columbia, so it was a pleasure to get invited to come back and, and spend some time with you. I'm really excited about this design competition. Um, tonight, I want to talk about tactical urbanism. So it's a wonky term, but I want to know how many of you are familiar with this idea. All right, I'm preaching to the choir. Great. Um, I just want to say it's good to be here. You know, there's a really good vibe that I felt all day. Um, I'll be honest, I'm tired. This is my fifth city this week. Um, it's only Thursday, so I'm a little bit worn down, but the energy today and the energy from you this evening is really amazing. So I think it says a lot about your community and, and what you can harness and continue to harness moving forward. Um, our company, Street Plans, um, we actually no longer have an office in San Francisco, um, but we are in Miami and New York. Um, we do a lot of work all over the country and the world. Um, we focus a lot on transportation issues, on urban design, public space. Um, we have several architects on staff, so we, get, we dabble in that from time to time. We do a lot of public outreach and engagement. Um, but our methodology for all of this work is really focused on making better places and using what we've coined as tactical urbanism to achieve that. So tonight, I hope that you uh, walk away with um, a more rich understanding about what this idea is, what this movement is. Um, I know a lot of you are familiar, um, but I hope you can see how this can be incorporated in not only, yes, your guerrilla activism in the middle of the night, and I've actually heard about some of that happening here in town, which is fun, but how this actually connects to city planning processes and development processes and how it can be a way to activate and create change faster and more sustainably. Um, and I hope you really do leave tonight feeling like, you know what, there's this spot in my neighborhood or on my block or someplace in the city where you feel like this approach could be applied and start thinking about ways to bring that to fruition. So I am a planner and an urban designer. And you know, when I started my career, um, you know, a little more over 10 years ago, I was really, really excited about this possibility of transformative change. That's like why I wanted to become a planner. You put the idea down on paper, you create, you know, an existing, you take an existing condition image and you make it look like this. And you're like, wow, that's magic. And then you realize it takes a lot more than just a pretty drawing to get shit done. <laughs> And that was my, you know, come to Jesus moment early on in my career was that it's, you know, we can make all the pretty pictures in the world, um, but we've got to deal with these people. <laughs> so change is hard. Um, change is very difficult. And it's possibly why 80% of our plans don't get implemented. Now, maybe you guys are better than that. Maybe you're implementing 30% or 40%. But the point being that it's very challenging to, to get things done um, in a very impactful way long-term way. And Jane Jacobs, of course, put her finger on this a long time ago when she said that city planning lacks tactics for building cities that work like cities. So what I think she meant by that was, okay, planners in the audience, we're really good at creating strategies and creating action item lists. We're really terrible at translating that to on the ground change and action that gets people involved. Right, so we can work up on this level, we can think about 30 years out, and that's actually very important to be long range in your thinking, but we've got to connect it to things on the ground. And so we are stuck in this system, and we have been for a very long time, of what we call conventional project delivery. And it's very slow, it's very expensive because it's slow. You know, politicians really, really struggle with our system because you know, they have to balance the need for long-term vision, but they need tangible results on the ground. So there's a real tension there between serving your community now, but trying to advance something in a you know, considered, thoughtful way at a time when they may not even be in office. Um, our planning process unintentionally excludes, uh, unfortunately sometimes intentionally excludes, large swaths of people from the conversation, which, no surprise, results in a lack of trust in government, institutions, and in our community. So I think we're leaving a lot of unrealized value um, starting first socially and then, yes, economically and environmentally um, on the table in our communities. So we have to start thinking about ways to 
um, you know, attack this issue. So we need new ways to build our cities together. So this is our, um, our big idea. And this comes out of frustration with this process on how can we get city leaders and planning departments and organizations and nonprofits and folks like yourself and then normal citizens who are just walking down the street to get excited about short term projects that can be potentially very scalable that are intended from the very beginning to create that long term change. Right. So something that's tactical has to be connected to strategy, has to be connected to that big picture and that vision. If you don't have it, then maybe it's a fun project and that doesn't mean don't do it, but it may not be tactical. So we've written a lot about this uh, over the years. Um, we published an online uh, booklet in 2011, kind of cataloging how cities and activists were getting these um, projects in the ground. And this was at a very different time. If you recall, there was you know, a lot less money floating around. Um, this is kind of towards the tail end of the Great Recession. And a lot of cities and a lot of communities are trying to figure out how do we keep momentum going with the demand for better streets and better public spaces and better neighborhoods with less resources. So we threw this online and I went on a vacation and I came back and literally thousands of people had access to this document. And for me at this time, this was two years into starting street plans and we were very idea and passion rich, but we were actually quite project poor. So I had the time to really kind of sink my, my brain, my mental energy into developing this idea. So one became two, became three, became four. We've applied this, you know, this idea with partners and you know, NGOs around the world, you know, New Zealand and Italy and South America, et cetera. And like a tactical project that comes in iterations, we did four publications before we even released our full length book, which we published with Island Press about uh, two and a half years ago. Most recently we published the um, Tactical Urbanist Guide to materials and design. So this is a this has more than 50 different materials in it that look at how you apply different materials or different types of projects, largely in streets and public spaces, to respond to conditions that might be a one day pop up or might be intended to be a one to three year project and everything in between. Um, we're actually releasing a second version of this document in a couple of weeks, which will have you know 15 new materials and a bunch of new case studies. But along the way, as we've researched and we've practiced and we've learned from partners and people who are doing this, sometimes better than us around the world, is that this idea is not new. And if you look back, you know, through history, the small things, the little moves about activating a street, you know, setting up you know, kiosks and stalls on the banks of the Seine, or in the middle of the night painting bike lanes in Montreal, people have been doing this for a very, very long time. We have an impulse as human beings to make better places for ourselves to commune in. And so we want to like really shine a light on the, you know, we have a lot of reverence for the history of people who take action, you know, themselves to make their places better. Um, and so, you know, more recently we see this idea as it's kind of been applied in the post internet age, having three distinct phases. I don't bore you with the academic, you know, parts of this discussion, but I think what's interesting to note is that, you know, I got excited because of the gorilla unsanctioned, middle of the night projects like Matt Tomasulu's Walk Raleigh project where he hung up his own wayfinding signs around town uh, with no permission. And very quickly, it, you know, people were upset and then they were very happy. And so he got invited into the city and those signs then became sanctioned and started putting them back up around town after they asked him to take them down, right? That's an exciting application. Um, but you start to see cities like New York and a few others take this concept and apply it to streets, public spaces, vacant lots, and start to really make a dent in uh, how we can conceive of our spaces that we share together. Most recently, we've seen that really the start of the transformation of design and planning practice. So we see this tool now, this approach, used globally in all sorts of situations by all sorts of actors. And you know, our goal and our hope is that this doesn't become, it doesn't stay a little bit on the fringe or as an activist thing, but becomes a core competency in a city, that people are allowed to partner and work together to create lasting change, but starting small and learning from those small changes. Um, so that's where a lot of our work is now, is helping to embed this idea. The benefits of tactical urbanism, uh, quickly, you know, it encourages people to work together in new ways. It's not often that, you know, you come to a public meeting and someone says, you know, what, let's skip the presentation, let's go out instead and paint the street, you know. That's great because that actually gets people who are on the street to take part, to see it, to be involved with it. 
you know, people can experience a different reality, not 10 years from now in a pretty drawing, which some of us can read and enjoy producing, but uh, don't understand, right? So we want people to actually experience the difference as soon as possible. In that way, we can widen public engagement. You know, so if we have this problem of excluding people, why don't we bring the ideas and the projects to where people already are in their daily life, the bus stop, the street corner, the neighborhood, in front of the, you know, the um, place where people are employed, at the community center, the library. You know, if we can do projects there, we're gonna actually be able to use them as a platform to engage. In this process, if we start small, we uncover things that don't work as well as those that do. It's more important to figure out what doesn't work quickly and expensively so you can kind of discard your ideas and then start to move forward with the things that really catch and hold, the lessons learned from the little micro failures. Um, and then finally, we try to deliver public benefit faster. You know, the more we can show and less that we tell, the more people get excited about actually taking things to the next level. We've seen that happen time and time again. Or in short, this. You've probably seen this image. It's a popular meme on the internet. But to me, it perfectly parodies us designers. You know, we think we know what people want to do, and we design it that way, and then people do the opposite, right? So what we're advocating for is starting to actually observe and test and prototype ideas to then design around those rather than just trying to figure it out in advance. And so we're putting the, the making, right? We're actually producing, we're making projects happen um, to have place making being the result. We want the you know, people to feel like this is an identifiable, exciting, inclusive place for us all to, to live in. So where we intervene, um, you know, we look for places that are actually kind of a little screwed up. Um, the undervalued, the unsafe, the unused, the unnoticed, or the plain unjust. And here are four examples from places that we've worked around the world and where we've actually transformed those places. Some of which have now gone into more permanent projects over time. And the idea here is that we are taking, you know, what seems to be an everyday environment and showcasing that it doesn't have to be that way, that it could be something very different. And so these projects, this approach, this idea, it's, it, it's everybody, right? It's top down, it's bottom up, it's everybody in between, whether you're a developer, you're an artist, you're an activist, you're, you know, city councilor. There's a role for you to play in delivering uh, tactical projects. And the methodology we, we use is one that we've stolen directly from a book called The Lean Startup, which is build, measure, learn. And this idea is for kind of software prototyping and uh, seeing what works, measuring what doesn't work, and then moving forward, right? As I've described earlier, um, cities are not software. I wanna put that out there, absolutely not. Um, but there's a lot we can learn from this process and this methodology. So we look at how we do a lightweight test, a second, even a third version, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that tonight. And so in all, all of our work, uh, we've learned two key things. If I could really boil it down is that, yeah, city departments and citizens are really hungry for something different, a new way to work together. Um, but to do so, you know, there's no policies. You know, there's no um, sense of how do we design this? Who takes care of it? Who maintains this? You know, what are the materials that we can utilize that will work for the time period of the project? Um, you know, a lot of projects that we try to do are, are straight up illegal by code. Um, and so that's challenging. And so again, that's why we're doing a lot of work now in trying to get things to be a little bit easier on, on people who are trying to do good things. So I'm going to basically give you six uh, examples tonight. I'm going to start with just kind of general applications about where you can utilize this approach. And then I'll finish with uh, three case studies from, um, well, two of our projects and one from elsewhere. So public engagement, um, we work tactically, as I mentioned, to engage people. And you deliver the project, you know, as a way to do that engagement. You don't necessarily have to have, you know, six months worth of public meetings and city council hearings to come up with the one day outreach event that's going to take over, you know, someplace in the street or a vacant lot, right? This is about actually doing that project without telling people so that you can interrupt their daily experience to gather their feedback and their opinion. Um, so we do that a whole host of ways, but we oftentimes do it at the outset or the middle part of a planning project. So we work on you know, master plans and quarter plans and all sorts of like, you know, decently funded projects, but we think about the budget in those projects for outreach and engagement as delivering them tactically, because we think it's much more effective to work in this manner to reach people on the front end to see what, what people are looking for in their communities. Here's an example from Jersey City. 
so just across the Hudson River in, in New York. Um, this is a, a neighborhood kind of on the west side of the city. You can even see it's West Side Avenue. And we did six of these pop-up um, demonstration projects as part of this pedestrian enhancement plan. And the idea was to not really tell anybody about it, but to organize these walking workshops in the neighborhoods. And they would just happen upon their walk to see an intersection that we had changed that morning. And so we went out and we painted six different intersections and then had a big feedback wall and ways to engage in, with people. And all the while that we're doing the installation, and this is basically, you know, um, white traffic tape and, and tempera paint, um, people are asking us questions. What are you doing out here? What is this for? This is great. Or I'm not really sure how to use this. It becomes that platform for engagement. And what we learned through those six different installations, which were in one of each, each of the six wards in the city, was that people were actually looking for a different kind of experience on the street. And so this is your typical street in Jersey City. You know, it's walkable. Um, this is mixed use, say a commercial corridor. And you know, what if we repurposed that street? Now I'm not saying that all these different uses have to be on there, but all of them could be delivered at the curbside at a relatively low cost and actually add a lot more diversity and economic impact in terms of the number of users that can use the street. So you think about this, this is nine parked cars. Maybe you have one and a half, maybe two people per car. You know, I can get that same number of people in a bike parking corral for servicing, you know, just person to person. That's one 20 foot space. Now imagine that being extruded down the block and all the different little things you can do to support businesses, to support pedestrian activity, to enliven that street space, to add value. And out of this process, this is one of our demo sites, um, the city got really excited. They got the message and they said, you know what? We're going to put 50 new curb extensions into our striping budget for the summer and go out and, and make these, um, you know, not permanent, but get them in the ground so that people can actually feel safer on the street and we can measure their impact over time. And so this is actually not fully finished. Um, I've not been back to that location yet, but here's an example where we're just starting to set up this, this fancy, you know, colorful little painting on the, on the street. But that's what it looks like now with you know the city installation just a few months later. So by delivering the plan and then immediately having this impact, just basically six to eight weeks later, people feel like I was involved in that plan. We spoke up about this intersection and now I feel safer. That matters. You know that matters to be responsive to a community and their concerns. Um, interim and iterative design. Um, you know, here's an example from from New York. I would be remiss not to show you New York tonight, but this is. A temporary plaza that was in place for about uh, three years and it is now looking like this it's still um, not quite finished but you can see how it's gone from the lightweight material and the tables and chairs and the umbrellas to being more hardscaped right that is a process being replicated over and over and over across the city at scale um, you know this is not New York City um, you probably will never be in New York City or want to be you're Columbia right so, but how can you learn from this process of change making? This does not require a lot of money. It requires a process that works for a community and works for your, you know, uh, what you're trying to achieve. There's another example of looking down at uh, Pike slash Allen Street in the Lower East Side from the Manhattan Bridge. This was interim. This was a road diet that took away two lanes of traffic, closed off access for left turns, and made this little pedestrian plaza. Two and a half years later, it looked like this. It might not take two, it might take more than two and a half years in a lot of places, um, but that shows you how you can learn from this to then invest in that in the design. So programs and policies, you know, so the future of this movement is, is what? It's policy? It's programs? In some ways, that's, that's the case because, again, our goal is to help communities create a process that works for everybody so that more and more people can get engaged in this effort. Um, so from Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we've helped set up a program, to Burlington, which I'll speak about in a little bit, Auckland, London has been very inspired by this, this process. Um, we've, we're creating policies that allow for communities to engage. Uh, 100 Resilient Cities is a program working all over the globe. They're trying to connect their big strategy of how do we make resilient places at the global scale down to the city block. So we've been helping them kind of translate what is resiliency to experiences on the ground. And so in Norfolk, they're experiencing a lot of flooding issues, increased rainwater, and um, we want to educate uh, the most impacted neighborhoods uh, with ways they can actually retain rain, right? So rain barrels, rain gardens, et cetera. And so we had a workshop, we brought them out into this alleyway, and we did a series of interventions over the course of a day, including getting the fire department up on the roof to use the hose 
to actually measure how quickly the water went from the roof down the downspout into the drain system and then how that changed once we hooked up a rain barrel, right? So they're really experiencing that. And out of that feedback that we got from the participants, we went to the city and said, we should think about actually embedding this, this process and putting funding behind it. So now the city has $2,000 grants they do out to neighborhoods to do you know, rain retention at a parcel scale for nine different types of projects from blue roofs to rain gardens. Um, so they've basically taken that idea and they've embedded it into something that's more sustainable. In Thessaloniki, this is in Greece, um, they identified through 100 Resilient Cities that their biggest issue is trust, trust in citizens, trust in the government. You know, there's an economic crisis that has continued to, to challenge um, many cities and communities in that country. And so the idea here was to create something that allowed community groups to partner together to activate public spaces. And we kind of whittled that down to a few different types, like parks and squares and plazas and what they call green spots in the streets. We did a lot of series of workshops and came up with a process which probably looks complicated to you. Um, the bottom would be the city side. The three steps is just the citizen side. So if you have an idea, we want to give them an outlet on how they can take that to the city, get it approved and move quickly to bring activity and energy to underutilized spaces. In Miami-Dade County, uh, we've been working with a grant from the Knight Foundation that is to uh, deliver what we call a quick build program. So for years, we've been frustrated as, as, as planners, as advocates, as consultants in Miami in terms of being able to deliver some of the best practices that you see around the globe. And so my partner, Tony, was able to get this program moving, which was to work with community groups to source ideas and then use private foundation dollars to fund those ideas. And then we would provide technical assistance with these different groups to go out and implement. And it's been relatively challenging. Uh, we received 68 applications. We picked 18 projects. We've got a second round of funding to move forward. And what we're really trying to, to achieve here is, is access to transit and access to public spaces. And we had to get a resolution passed by the county itself, even though they were a formal partner listed on the grant, to create what we call a flexible and streamlined traffic engineering process to allow for quick build programming projects. Right, So we've had to go to the highest level to get their support, and it's still been very challenging. But here's the kind of project that we're trying to deliver. This is a little um, little stub street with nine parking spaces that we're able to transform with a street mural um, to be the place where people have their um, weekly farmer's market and then once a month have First Friday. It's just like it's first Thursday tonight. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with three case studies, parks, streets and buildings so we'll keep it in in miami uh, we got excited about parking day you know several years ago um, that's my partner tony standing up and we found a site with a local landowner who wanted to see it in front of his property and we went out and we did parking day it was the first one in miami 2011 and one of our colleagues ralph rosado came to the installation and said guys this is really great but you know i'm not really sure why you're messing around with one parking spot when just a block away, we've got literally hundreds of parking spots that are underutilized in one of the most challenging streets in the city. And so, you know, to Ralph, we said, well, challenge accepted. So consider Biscayne Boulevard is like your assembly, right? It's very wide. It has these big medians that used to be more like a boulevard condition, which are only used for parking and not even used that often unless there's a huge event happening in Bayfront Park. So in 2012, uh, we were able to get a small grant, $10,000 from the Miami Foundation, to do a one-week installation to transform one of the six medians into a public space, something that was missing from the core of the downtown as it continues to densify and become this dynamic 24-7 city. And this was what the result was. Now, I'll tell you that 20 of, of the $10,000, $7,500 went to the parking authority to give us permission to actually access the space. To say nothing of the fact that, that this is pretty much what it looked like on most mornings. This is like 10 a.m. So they're not really missing that much revenue and there's parking spaces everywhere. Anyways, so what this did though, you know, we, we basically brought in 30 partners to help program and install this project, um, including the, the Miami Marlins who donated the sod. And what we thought was, you know, this is kind of a risk. If we can get 30 different partners on board and it fails and it doesn't go well, we can spread that blame across 30 organizations. If it's a success, we all take credit for it. And that's the power of these projects is that everyone 
thought it was a success and it felt really good. And so it created this buzz across downtown and across the city, which led the Downtown Development Authority to actually invest in doing a plan for these six median areas. So here you can see what was eight lanes of traffic now brought down to four, including the medians and, and bikeways, et cetera. And that attracted the attention of the Knight Foundation, which then funded this project um, at a much bigger scale. So the next level, the next iteration from the first test to the second kind of you know, revolution um, is a one month long project with three medians as opposed to just one week and one median. So we worked with volunteers in early uh, 2017 and we built out this space in a number of different ways, responding to a lot of the lessons that we learned in the first round. You know, working with the State Department of Transportation on their, their corridor is, of course, challenging. But because it was only for a month, we were able to kind of cajole them into saying yes on a number of things, including adding on-street parking, which is usually prohibited from state roadways. Um, to say nothing of the fact that this is the most dense area in the entire state of Florida. Um, we were able to get city bike stations on, on, uh, on site. And then you do art crosswalks and a number of different things that they had not allowed before because it was just a 30 day test. You know, by day it looked like this. We were attracting lunchtime people, the working, working crowd, um, you know, on the weekends in the morning, we had lots of activities every day, bringing people into the space. And then by night we celebrated. And so there were peak moments of concerts and markets where literally hundreds and hundreds of people were in the space, um, enjoying it and feeling like this should be left, uh, left permanent. And that was the result we were looking for. So over the course of the 23 days, the project was actually live. We had 20,000 users come through. And I can't think of a single charrette where you get 20,000 people there all at once, right? But this is kind of how we're approaching this project is we're gonna design it, we're gonna get feedback, and we're gonna learn from that feedback and create you know, the next step. And so what we learned, uh, and it was a number of things, uh, we had cameras mounted uh, that were measuring all sorts of different things in a creepy way, right? But one of the benefits was that we learned that women were underrepresented in the space. And that would be hard for us, I think, to fully understand over the course of a month. We can't be there at all hours of the day, but we were able to understand that there was a gender imbalance. According to the numbers, 59% versus 41%. So if we're gonna design a space for everybody, you know, we need to design a space that's more appealing to half the population. So that became one of the central lessons moving forward is to actually dig into those conversations before more money is invested in this place. And then we had the result that we wanted. You know, once you take one, one of these projects away, it can be as powerful, if not more powerful, than setting it up. So there is a demand now. Why is this going away? We love this space. We want to see more of it. And the city commissioner for this district, who um, was skeptical of the project, you know, towards the end said, "I will not leave office until we have funding committed to make this a permanent, uh, you know, installation, not on just one or three, but all six of the medians, which was, you know, the result again we were looking for." So streets. You guys have some challenging streets here. Yeah. Uh, just walking around today, and to say nothing of the heat, um, it's it's Main Street's great. You've done a lot of great work there, and that seems very accessible. You get off a block, and, and it's less so. Um, and I know that you know that. So I'm going to talk to you about a community in Burlington, Vermont, obviously very different from Miami, very different from Columbia, but a college town of about 40,000 people. Uh, it's a wonderful place. And we started working there about three years ago, and we're asked to do their first pedestrian and bicycle master plan. So you can see, it's probably hard to read, but there's a bunch of disconnected streets in terms of cycling. Um, even with that, they were achieving 7% of the population cycling around town, which is great by any standard in America. So this is our, our 10 year plan. A much denser network with a minimal grid of protected bike lanes going from the university down the waterfront and the south end of the city to the north. Those are the blue lines. And we want to double cycling and decreased driving from over half to down to about a third of trips. But even in Burlington, a very liberal town, a super, super blue dot in the blue state, change is hard. In fact, maybe even more hard than other places. Um, and you can just ask that you know, to Peggy O'Neill, who is a mother who, while we were starting this project back in 2015, wanted to do a one day pop up bike lane. She heard of all these things happening around the country. She knew the city was starting a bike plan. What better way to like get engaged than to go to the city and ask, can we do a one day pop-up protected lane to get our kids to school? And the city said, Peggy, that's a great idea. We're gonna go in that direction. We've hired a consultant. It's gonna be you know, a focus of the plan, but no. We have no way to say yes. Um, there's no policy, there's no program. What would the liability situation be 
Um, we love your energy, but you know, come to the next public meeting. That is a response that happens all too often, right? So if you have a Peggy in your community, you've got to really satiate Peggy's desire to make things happen. And people in your community don't want to know what they can't do. They want to know things that they can do, right? We need to reverse that um, equation. And so I want to go back again in time and think about Burlington in the 1970s. They had this wonderful four block pedestrian street, one of the most successful ones in the country. It's like the economic engine of Vermont. And this is what they were doing in the early 70s. They were testing and prototyping ways to close that down to cars and to open it up to people. And this is not the, you know, maybe the best approach for every single street, but for this street, it made sense. You weren't even allowed to dine outdoors because of health reasons in the 1970s on the street. And that's now become that first street I showed you that's great public space. So they were even prototyping back then. And I said to the city, you know, well, guys, you can't just shut down the Peggy O'Neill's of the world. You've actually, this is part of your history. Let's go back to that and be inspired by how we can start to test ideas. And the city said, okay, well, you know, do you know a consultant that can do that? And we said, well, we have an idea. Um, and we actually had never done this before, but we've been wanting to do something like this. And we wound up working with them to add on this, this program to the master plan. We thought of this as a way to embed a change-making you know, element to the master plan where it was now in the community's hands to figure out how to do demonstration projects to take our plan and start to actually get that on the ground. And so we kind of pre-approved with the city a bunch of different project types. Uh, we looked at design, location, and criteria. We gave them tools like outreach posters that they could just print and fill, on, you know, fill in themselves to make it easy. We dealt with liability head on. You know, it turned out that the city has a volunteer ordinance that covers them legally for park volunteers day, days of volunteering in the park system. So we said, well, let's just repurpose that for streets. Can we just take that as a, you know, you've covered this, this issue before and it's a little bit different, but let's use that as a baseline. And they actually went for it. And so it became pretty easy to have people sign a release of liability and just to move forward with these projects. So they had this big event coming up that same fall in 2015 called Art Hop. Probably not that dissimilar from what happens here on Thursdays. And the idea was, well, let's bring these projects to where people are and then tell them about the master plan and get their feedback through doing a demonstration. And you know, we basically were able to reach over the weekend about 10,000 people who came through this festival and then another event called Open Streets. So that same weekend, north of the downtown, they were doing, um, they were shutting off about two miles of streets just for the day to let people bike, walk, skate, just enjoy the community. And so we set up a system of protected bikeways and neighborhood greenways to get people from the neighborhood to that route. And this was, again, it was just a two-day test. And we were testing things in the plan that we were already considering. And we were using that as, a, again, a platform for engagement, testing all sorts of things that had never been done in the city before, and including inviting the, the fire trucks out, who did not love our design, by the way. Negative feedback. Negative feedback from the Postal Service. Um, but over time, we were able to take what we heard and consider that into our, in our designs. You know, we learned that you know, traffic speeds were, you know, were much slower while still moving the same volume of cars. Uh, we learned that the way that we were considering the design of the street should not be the way they were considering it, at least for the interim. And we learned that people who live in this neighborhood don't actually park on the street. They all have driveways and garages behind their homes. And so we, we were actually able to remove a lane of parking in our proposal and have support to do that by the very fact that people who do park in this neighborhood are parking there from out of town, trying to avoid the downtown meters, which started a couple blocks away. Right? We only learned that information, only had that intel by being on the blocks for you know, a few days working and installing and hearing from people what they wanted to see. And then finally coming up with a long-term design that would meet the fire department's demands, emergency responders, be protected, add stormwater enhancements, et cetera. And so we understood from this process where else people want to see this infrastructure. The city learned, you know what? We don't want just volunteers to go and do this and show us up. We actually think we can do this as well. And so two weeks later, they were out there doing the exact same stuff that the volunteers have done you know, enhancing the bikeway system. And then they took it and they scaled it up. And by the way, we're still doing the master plan. We're still working on the big picture here. And they're taking materials that we're recommending and they're doing road diets and they're starting to like really get into this stuff at a larger scale. Um, intersection treatments. And then the local nonprofit, Local Motion, was so big, you know, such a big part of this. You know, they said, look, we want to actually be able to activate people on the advocacy side. So they got a small grant to fill up a trailer with materials, which we helped them design. And they can drive all around Burlington and the state of Vermont doing these pop-up demonstration projects, educating people about public space and safe streets. And so this part of the story ends very well. This is Peggy, one year later, uh, who was interviewed in NPR 
as the change maker who started all this, right? So this comes down to trust, this issue of trust again. So if you propose something, your city says, no, that sucks. If your city says, well, you know what, let's try to figure this out. Um, that's an amazing way to build more Peggy's into the system to help the community get its longer term big picture goals actually accomplished in a shorter amount of time. So to move it forward, um, this is where things get more designy and materially like and longer term. We've worked with the city to create a design and materials guide to help them bridge this gap between the pop up and the demonstration and the long term capital project. And we think of this as interim design. So we're looking at design and material standards on how the pop ups become this, which is actually what has happened. So again, we're still writing this guide and the city started going out and using the draft already and installing projects. And I was just there um, yesterday checking in on a whole host of projects that have come out of the ground using very interim things like these planters, you know, green markings, you know, and I'm looking at these streets, I'm seeing people I weren't wasn't seeing on the streets before. Skateboarders in the middle of the street, women without helmets biking down the street very comfortably, older people on bikes, something that you would not see typically on a neighborhood residential street until you slowed the cars down and create a place for people to be and be visible. So I'm gonna end on Memphis. Uh, Memphis is one of my favorite cities and they're doing some amazing work and it started with trying to reactivate streets uh, and dead buildings. And so this is a neighborhood on Broad Avenue and they also received, this community group received a grant to reactivate the storefronts for one weekend. So doing pop-up shops, you know, temporary bike lanes, all sorts of great things on the street. And they call it a new face for an old broad, right? So very clever. So I'm kind of counting on you to come up with a, with a really clever name for Lady Street, by the way, because <laughs> I think we can outdo them. But the result of this project was $20,000 invested. Um, within a couple of years, it's seen a huge increase in those vacant storefronts being activated. Um, they saw 25 new businesses, 29 properties renovated or rebuilt, um, and a bunch of public art installations. And this is a neighborhood that didn't see this activity for you know, several decades. The mayor uh, at the time, A.C. Wharton, was so excited by the impact, as well as the community was so excited by the impact of this you know, weekend event that drew 20,000 people that he said, you know what, we've got to actually use this method, not the method of we're going to just you know, have billions of dollars fall from the sky and invest in our neighborhoods. And that's a really important principle for Detroit, I'm sorry, for Memphis, because if you think of Detroit as a really challenged place economically, as an empty place, Memphis has the exact same population as Detroit and double the land area. So let that sink in. You think Detroit is struggling, Memphis has its issues. And so to his wisdom, he said, let's start actually supporting this work because it's going to get things done. And so they created a manual with a nonprofit called Livable Memphis called the Memfix Manual. And they started applying it on a quarterly basis doing pop-up projects. We partnered with Livable Memphis and a whole bunch of other organizations, including Strong Counts in 2014, and we did this boot camp looking at all aspects of the city. And they brought me to this neighborhood called The Edge, which reminds me in some ways of the Vista and actually of, of Bull Street as well. And we started sitting down saying, look, these streets are too wide. That could be a plaza. You need to add crosswalks here. And that was just kind of an impromptu interview. And a couple of years later, I'm sorry, that image is blurry. This starts happening. And no longer is this becoming a one day or two day thing. Now the city is partnering with these nonprofits and getting striping in and actually letting these, these tests last longer to be placeholders for things like this. So this is the second version of that project, right? We're going to the second, you know, iteration and it's, you know, much more long lasting. Um, now has an entity to do a lot of the, the maintenance and the management of the, of the, of the public space it includes bike lanes, public art. This is an automotive sales district um, historically. And so the streamers that you see atop the street, um, was basically referencing that history. So all this stuff is starting to come alive. All these interventions are starting to bring life in terms of new restaurants, businesses, to vacant spaces. Uh, they're moving on and doing you know, connectivity now into and out of this district, including a lot of protected bike lanes. And they're using a tactical kit. These are just curb stops and you know, 18 inch you know, little ballers, right? So this is very expensive to do. And they're doing whole road diets that include this material pallet. And so this becomes a muscle in a community. You start to learn how to think tactically, both at an advocacy level on up to the city level. And the biggest thing they probably tackled coming out of a lot of this work was the Tennessee Brewery. This is a building that is iconic in Memphis. 
It has this incredible courtyard. It was built in 1879. It's been vacant forever. No developer has been able to basically make the numbers work to redevelop it. So people got together in Memphis and said, you know what, this building is really important to save. The current owner was threatening to demolish it so he could just start from scratch. And they scraped together about $35,000 and uh, four weeks of four weekends, I should say, of sweat equity. They got the city who understands this approach now to give them a very you know, flexible occupancy permit for just the ground floor. And the idea was if we can just activate the first ground floor and get people in there, people will see the potential. And then we'll think about how that goes floor by floor by floor rather than trying to do the whole thing all at once. And in five weeks during their Memphis and May festival, $35,000 in, $265,000 in beer sales alone to say nothing of the food, right? If that's not a market study, I'm not sure what is. So this became a hub for Memphians. And lo and behold, um, that same summer, just weeks later, a new plan emerged and a new developer bought the property from the existing owner and said, you know what, I'm gonna come in and I wanna invest uh, nearly $30 million to not only do the building, but do the big vacant lot across the street and that's how I'm gonna make it pencil. And while we're doing the design and getting the permits to do all the work, we're gonna keep the beer garden seasonally in that amazing courtyard. And so that story is how you apply tactical urbanism to, to buildings and, and vacant land. And I was just there in July and it's now leased up, right? So now people are occupying that building. They've saved this building by starting with people who just wanted to get access to that ground floor. That's short-term action for long-term change. That's tactical. So how about this lovely lady? How are we gonna source ideas for this? How are we gonna connect Vista with Main Street and get more people circulating, make it safer, more exciting, more vibrant? I know that a lot of you probably have a lot of ideas. I'm excited about sourcing new ideas from around the country, if not further afield, on how your downtown can continue to evolve and become a place for everybody. And I'm gonna hope that we see this methodology as part of those proposals, right? How do we utilize the demonstrations, the pilots, and inner design approach to arrive at the long-term capital build-outs, things that can really be transformative and sustained over the long term. And so I want to conclude on you know, this idea that tactical urbanism is not about the tactic or the trick, even though you can be very clever. And it's not about the park, like in Miami, or the street in Burlington, or the building in Memphis. You know, this is about working at scale, making change add up over time. And it's fundamentally about people. Right? We work for and with people to get these things done, to get people bought in and excited about a vision and a future that we're excited about, that I think a lot of you in this room are excited about, that we know is possible. So unless we're not, if we're not working together, we're just not going to be able to achieve that in the long term. So if you're thinking about the experience of doing these projects, the brain remembers 10% of what it reads. Right? That's, unfortunately, as I get older, shockingly true. 20% uh, of what it hears but 90% of what it does or simulates. So we're trying to do the doing and the simulation so people really can physically and viscerally understand the potential for long-term change. Um, thank you. <laughs>